Very quiet room. Oh. In other words, previously there wasn't. <laughs> Starting the meeting in three, two, one. Call the May 25th, 2022 hybrid meeting of the Wisconsin Natural Resources Board to order. Please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance to our great country. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, I'd also like to take a moment of silence for the victims in the Texas shooting. Um, just have one minute of silence. Thank you. Okay, on behalf of the Wisconsin Natural Resources Board, I welcome each of you today to our meeting. Please know that there is sometimes a delay in the broadcast and it's easy to talk over each other. Make sure your computer or tablet is set up and running and you are able to turn your mute on and off when you are not talking. I will ask you to mute if there is any background noise. Board members, please ask for the floor when you want to speak and get recognized. Also, motions will be made slower, so Kari can make sure who made them and uh, remember to state your name when doing so. Kari also will interpret the meeting if she is not certain it, as to who is making the motion, etc. Staff presenters via Zoom. Please make sure your Zoom is muted and your video is turned off until I announce your item. Once your item or items are completed, please exit the meeting. Our meetings are televised live via YouTube, and we especially want to welcome and thank our viewers for tuning in. Public testimony is welcome at each and every regular scheduled NRB meeting. The transparency of our meetings and the ability for the public to testify or comment to us is the benchmark of how this board has operated for over 50 years. This meeting, we have one appearance via Zoom and one appearance in person. I would like to give special thanks to our technical and communications teams. Christopher Tall for Zoom, Scott Miller for live webcasts, Madeline Alder for sound, Jeff Marginal, and Chris Welch for ensuring all board information is available online for the public, and the DNR's Office of Communication for streaming this meeting on the department's YouTube channel, and for managing press releases, newsletters, social media, and more all to keep the public informed. Kari Lee Zimmerman is our Wisconsin Conservation Congress liaison who helps us work with our longtime partners dealing with our natural resources. I would like to thank Lori Ross, our now retired NRB board liaison, providing the link between public staff and sometimes ourselves. The communication and historic continuity between the board and the department is unsurpassed with Lori's leadership. Law enforcement, Nick Majofsky, Chief Casey Krieger and his warden team will, well, it goes without saying your staff's ability to protect our resources along with our board members, staff and public safety speak for itself. I would like to thank the DNR secretary, Preston Cole, secretary, deputy secretary, Sarah Barry, assistant deputy secretary, Steve Little, Chief Legal Counsel Cheryl Heinemann and all department staff for their participation in making presentations. Your time is valuable and respect that. Lastly, would also like to thank the 2,200 permanent employees and 1,477 limited term employees of the Department of Natural Resources for their continued commitment and tireless work for the Department of Natural Resources and all citizens of this great state. I just wanted to make one note about Kari <laughs> stepping up here. Um, this is by far her busiest month in her real job. And she's also taken on the responsibility for this meeting. So thank you, a special thanks to Kari. <laughs> Thank you.
Board members, any questions or comments? Kari, please take the roll. Here. Karen Adams. Karen Adams. Harry Hilgenberg. Here. Marcy West. Here. Bill Smith. Here. Dr. Heather Crane. Here. Craig Kesner. Here. Um, is Sharon on yet, or did she get back on? Does anybody know? Okay, all board members are present except for Sharon. Make a motion to approve the agenda, but I believe you have a one change for timeline only. Uh, that's correct. Um, actually, there's two timeline changes. Right, move, move the approve the agenda with this timeline that you're going to tell us about. Second. Okay. So I'd like to move Lori next on the agenda. Um, she's on the retirement thing, and we have a little special thanks we want to send out to Lori um, Ross. I promised I would not make her get up and stand in the podium and give a speech. So don't ask her for one, okay? <laughs> um, but so just a little bit about Lori and um, she has just been let's, tremendous. Let's, let's, prove, let's prove the motion. Okay, we got to prove the motion? Yeah, the agenda. Okay. Motion? Yeah, all, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? None? All right. Motion carries. Motion carries. Motion carries. <laughs> all right. So um, let's uh, just. Hi, Lori. Good morning. Good morning. It's not normal seeing you over there. <laughs> Behind the red rope. <laughs> yeah. So we uh, we appreciate you taking the time to come in for this now that you're just a citizen. Um, but I wanted to relay a little story how I fit, first met Lori. She was the secretary. And I kind of had created havoc for the uh, the liaison's office with uh, people sending emails. And at that time, an awful lot of handwritten letters that she had to scan and get to the board. Um, and she was totally gracious through that whole process, welcoming that input. And it just stuck in my mind that that is how we I like to see our DNR. Um, and she was been that way her entire tenure on the board. So I did at the time, since I made her life so miserable that first year, um, promise her that I owed her a case of beer. <laughs> well, then I was on the board and I figured, gee, there might be ethics violations if I bought her the case of beer. So now that she's a normal citizen. <laughs> Miller 64, right, Kaz? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got 30 yeah, that's for interest. So, so uh, that's all I'd like to say. She's just been tremendous. Um, and I hope that the administration can find somebody as good to fill that role for the future of the board. Um, any other board members have any comments? It's very interesting to join the board. And I had never been at a board meeting before until I got, was appointed to the board. And the first person that I met was Lori. And I couldn't have imagined how wonderful all the employees of the DNR were if, she was, if they were like her. And she did a wonderful, wonderful job. And I consider her not to, not only to be a great assistant for uh, board members, but personal friends for board members. And Bonnie and I want to thank Lori for all the wonderful things or outreach that she did, especially during my time as I was chairman to make sure that I was on point and I did the stuff I was supposed to do and did it in the right order and uh, got all the motions carried. So, Lori, thank you very, very much. We wish you the very, very best. Uh, you know, during this period of time that you're on the board, you become a family. And Lori's had some bumps in the road with her family, and we were all there uh, we're rooting for her, making that. sure everything went okay. Uh, because, you know, we, we have those bumps in the road as we go. 
and Lori was great in handling my bumps. So thank you very much, Lori. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Lori, as, as uh, past chair and, and board member for a few years, um, I speak for a lot of people in the room, staff included. Uh, your professionalism is unsurpassed. Um, you never wavered to transparency and truth. Uh, you always made sure that things were done properly. Um, if I ever was off on a tangent, you would reel me back in and say, this is the way it is. This is that was a big job. That's a big job. <laughs> I like to fish. Um, so all I can say is that, you know, your smile is it's, it's endless, which makes the day easier. Um, we're going to miss you. Uh, you're going to enjoy your next phase of your life. Like Clint's got a big smile under that big cowboy hat over there <laughs> because he's going to have his, his, his girl back to him for a while. But I'm, I know you're never going to leave. You're always going to be interested in what happens in the natural resource of the state. And uh, you're going to be interested in how this board continues this process and you care deeply. That's why you were here for so many years. So I want to personally congratulate, congratulate you, but so does everybody that's sitting here. I mean, we can all, the whole room could talk about you. You're going to be a hard one to follow, but you know, she's not doing bad for the first 30 days. Uh, <laughs> she's an ace. So enjoy your retirement. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So she has work to do, I understand. Uh, yeah. On behalf of the board, uh, Laura, do you know what one of these are? Oh, what is that? A battery? Yeah. It's, it's for tools. Nice. You're, Clint's going to keep you busy working. <laughs> Um, while so you're what off here, you Milwaukee them. tools. Yes, we love them. Yeah. Saws all. Should we name them all? <laughs> so, we, out of the generosity of the board here, we did purchase you a tool that we found out you had an interest in, and uh, that's the Milwaukee electric lawnmower. Oh, no way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, oh yeah. my gosh. So, uh, Clint said that, you know, it's time for you to get the, you know, that old no mow maze almost done. Stuff's getting a little long. Right. So, charge it up, take it home, and get to work. Oh, my gosh. I have been like, every time we go to one of those stores, it's right there. It's like, oh, my gosh, wouldn't it be great to have that in our garage and use it? Thank you so, very much. Enjoy. So, we got that, and you can stay busy mowing lawn. But don't think that I'm not going to give you a call from time to time if I get stuck on things. Oh, I so, would be very lonely if I don't hear from you. So, all right. Well, thank you very much for your service. And oh, and we do have this card. We can pass that over to her from the board also. Thank you, Lori. I just want to say it's been a wonderful, great honor to work with such esteemed people as our board from 2007 to this point. Everyone has their passions and their loves and what they um, focus on doing. And the board process to me has been just an eye opener. It's the um, catch and balances of the department. And I think it's just a wonderful group to have in charge of our resources so and the people that fill each chair are just amazing people I can't see enough about each of you and the people at the department that I've worked with all these years and all of our constituents in the state so it's been a wonderful 15 years working for the board and I don't regret one day of it love you all <laughs> Unless you have mold, and you can have one. <laughs> okay, and there's one other change to the order of the agenda. Um, I'd like to uh, hear the new chair of the Conservation Congress next. He has a, a family issue that he's got to get back for, and uh, so we're gonna. Take, I'm not sure what item that is. Is that an informational? 6A. 6A? 6A, yep. yep. So we're going to hear 6A now. Thank you. Well, good morning. 
Morning. Morning. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Kazmierski, Deputy Secretary Berry, board members. It's once again a great pleasure to come before this board today, as currently re-elected chair of the Conservation Congress, and have this opportunity to review the business conducted by the Congress at our annual convention. The convention has been a long time coming. The last statewide convention being held in 2019 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was wonderful to be together in person once again. I'd like to thank Chairman Kazmierski for his presentation at our convention and the attendance of the board members, Marcy West, Terry Hilgenberg, Bill Smith at our, at our meeting. Speaking on behalf of our delegation, it was a privilege to have four sitting board members attend our convention and interact with our delegates. Your involvement and presence at our events demonstrates your commitment to the role that Congress plays as an advisory body to the Natural Resources Board and is very much appreciated by our delegation. Conservation Congress convened for its 88th annual convention on May 12th through the 14th in the Wisconsin Dells. Our statewide delegation voted on the DNR and NRB advisory questions and each of the proposed Congress advisory questions from the 2022 Spring Hearing Online Questionnaire. And I'd briefly like to review that with you here today. There were 45 Congress advisory proposals presented for the public comment at this year's spring hearings. 28 of those proposals were recommended for advancement to the Department, the Natural Resource Board, and Legislature for consideration as possible future rule changes or legislation. Among the suggested changes supported by the WCC are removing the burbot from the list of Wisconsin rough fish, waiving license requirement for an assistance who is helping a person with a disability to fish and allow the dispatch of illegally trapped animals with a rimfire rifle or handgun within 50 feet of the center line of any unpaved road. WCC also advanced resolutions 580121 from the floor. This resolution related to the increasing daily bag limit for Northern Pike and the Tiger Cap foliage in Sawyer County. In addition, the delegation affirmed the assignment of most of the over 550 2022 citizen resolutions to the WCC's advisory committees while others were discussed on the floor of the Congress. The WCC unanimously supported a resolution to work with the NRB and the legislature to keep partisan politics out of conservation and resource management, in addition to affirming the Knowles Nelson Stewardship Fund. Full delegation reviewed and registered their support for all the DNR advisory questions. However, Congress does not support NRB question 17 related to the additional studies of the impacts of the crossbow season on Wisconsin gun deer season. This is the 10th year we've had the YCC, the Youth Conservation Congress, and 22 of our youth delegates were able to attend and participate in some portion of the convention and youth events arranged specifically for them. YCC coordinator Kyle Zenz has been working with the program since 2019, but this was her first year in-person convention. She's been doing a fantastic job and was even nominated for one of the Outstanding Natural Resource Professionals Award this year. The kids participated in a trap shoot, field trips, the Aldo Leopold Shack and International Crane Foundation, in addition, a hiking camp at Devil's, State, Devil's Lake State Park. We handed out services, certificates, and pins to those delegates who have served the Congress for 15, 20, 25, 30, and over 35 years. Impressively, one of our delegates, Bill Howell from Crawford County, has been on the Congress for 68 years. Mm -hmm. Additionally, we acknowledge the work of those active and former delegates who have passed away during the last three years. This year, we recognize 19 individuals through memorial resolutions. Congress recognized several DNR employees and citizens for their fantastic work in the area of conservation. Our outstanding DNR professional awards went to wildlife biologist Paul Samerdyke for 2020, wildlife technician Jeff Lang for 2022, migratory biologist Taylor Finger 2022, YCC coordinator Kyle Zenz 2022, Warden's Brad Peterson 2019, Trevor Tracy 2020, and Ryan Manus from 2021 were awarded the Waterfall Officer of the Year by the WCC's Migratory Committee. 2022 Local Conservation Organization of the Year went to the Daniel Boone Conservation League. Educators of the Year were David Michaels, Michelson and Ruth Ann from 21 and 22. WCC's David, Ad, David A. Ladd Delegate of the Year went to Mark LaBarbera in 2020 and Terry Rarig 2021, Al Horvath 2022. 
The WCC also inducted past Congress Chair Bill Murphy into the Conservation Congress Hall of Fame. On February May 13th, the delegates from our 11 districts elected the 2022-23 District Leadership Council. I'd like to thank each of the councilors from the 2021-2022 that will not be returning this year as councilors and also congratulate those who have been elected and re-elected. I've included a list of this year's District Leadership Council for your information. Our 2022-2023 Executive Committee is Joe Weiss from Washburn County, who's with us today. Paul Reith from Dane County. Uh, Dale Moss from Dodge County is our Secretary. Terry Rarick from Buffalo County, who's with us today, is our Vice Chair and myself as Chair. In closing, I want to reiterate our appreciation for the support of this board, and we look forward to working closely with you this year on all important natural resource management issues. We do also have a couple other District Leadership Council members, Bob Winsick from Walkershaw County and Dale Ebert from Florence County. And I must say myself, Lori, you will be missed. So the Congress's success is based on not me, but two women, Kari, and she's only on loan for you guys, so get excited. <laughs> and Lori, she's made our work with the board phenomenal. So. And I finally have a bag of her rub. <laughs> you guys are pretty good. <laughs> Members, any questions for the new Congress chair? Doc. So, Rob, welcome back. Um, I was pleased when I saw that happen down there. I know when the, your tenure on the Congress um, was intense and it was beneficial to everybody. My question to you is what's been frustrating that I've seen the last couple of years with the Congress is. I believe the statute and the charge from the legislators is to is to report to the NRB. Do you agree with that? Yes, sir. So sometimes when I see questions that are thrown on to the spring hearings. It's really nothing that's in our wheelhouse. Um, and so what happens is it confuses the public. The public sees these questions. They think the NRB has got something to say about the question that they propose. And I think that's that's a disservice. I think the question coming from the Congress should be pertained to what's in our wheelhouse, what we can control. Now, if you want to influence legislators, number one, I think legislators would just assume, ask you for influence, but that's a separate issue. And I don't even think it's in the charge of the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. I think that should be looked at by the executive committee, exactly what is the charge from the legislators? Because that's what we should follow. We should follow what they want us, to, what they want you to do and what, what they want us to do. Everybody kind of stay in their lanes, I think when things run smoother. So some of those questions that I get, I'm like, you know, that's nothing to do with us climate accord and all the stuff that's, you know, clearly it's in, it's across the street or it's in the federal government, even sometimes it drifts away. So I hope that in the next 12 months, you vet the questions well. I can't say people don't passion put stuff up, but I hope you stay within the charge of the Congress and advise us because we look forward to it. This board looks forward to what you have to say and put the emphasis back onto what we can change and or not change based on your input. Already on it. Already talked to Cheryl, and she's going to talk to Chandra, and we're going to have take a look at our review process of resolution review process next year. All right, I appreciate so, it. Absolutely, welcome. I agree. Welcome back. Welcome back. Miss you. Appreciate it. Got a lot of things done. <laughs> so looking forward to it. All right. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chairman. Marcy. Oh, sorry. Go I know ahead. this is going to be hard. Um, thanks for accommodating me. Um, I just wanted to say hello and add my congratulations. I'm sorry I missed the event last night, but um, I'll reach out to the district members that are in my region and hopefully uh, get to have more thorough discussions uh, than we get to have at the meetings, but really appreciate being included in the conference and uh, look forward to working with you as well. Marcy, I'll have Kari get you my cell number. Call me anytime. Great, thank you. Bill, I'll text you. I have your number, so thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. Bye -bye. Thanks, Rob. A motion for the consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries.
Action items. Uh, adoption citizens testimony and written welcome comment. Uh, presentation of the 2021 Shikar Safari Club International Wildlife Officer of the Year Award. Uh, staff presentation by Casey Krieger, Chief Conservation Warden. Casey? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Kierzmierski, Deputy Secretary Sarah Berry, Assistant Deputy Secretary Stephen Little, and members of the Natural Resources Board. My name is Casey Krieger, and I am the Chief Warden and Division Administrator for the Division of Public Safety and Resource Protection. I'm very pleased to be here today to introduce you to the 2021 Shikar Safari Wildlife Officer of the Year Award, Lieutenant John Sinclair. I'd like to take a moment to share a little bit about John, if I could. John was hired in 2012 and served as a field warden both in Kenosha and Dane counties. In 2018, John was promoted to lieutenant for the newly created Rock River team located in South Central region. John is an accomplished leader who is never afraid to take on new challenges and who makes the most of his opportunities. He has a humble, humanistic approach and style making him engaging and approachable by, by all. John leads by example and thoroughly ensures his actions reflect both his personal and agency values. It is important to John to make sure he influences others in positive ways. John is very responsive and prioritizes excellent customer service. He has served on the department-wide excellence team with his sub-team specifically focusing on how the department can implement and include service excellence throughout recruitment and the hiring process. Additionally, John has done has done uh, a lot of work in leading the strategic planning committee and uh, serving on the, as chair of the recruitment committee for several years. John is a big picture thinker. He led efforts to reach new citizens who wouldn't otherwise be familiar with conservation wardens or the DNR. He works to provide information on how to connect with the agency, what employment looks like and how to apply. John is passionate about reaching candidates who reflect the citizenry of all Wisconsin citizens whether they are from cities, small towns, or rural places, whether they hunt, hike, paddle, or simply enjoy the clean air and water we all need. John sees the value of the diversity that people bring to our agency. John has developed strong relationships and partnerships across the state. He continues to work with civic organizations to promote working for the Department of Natural Resources. Recently, he has been building relationships with groups such as the Urban League of Greater Madison. Just some, some of John's recruiting efforts last year led uh, the department forward, contacting 52 personal recruiting contacts, 313 school contacts with professors, as well as reaching out to 57 new community school groups. John and his Rock River team continue to build on strong relationships and partner organizations. They routinely work closely with sheriff's departments and local LE agencies to maximize resources and ensure public safety. On several occasions, John and his team have responded to, to incidents such as missing persons, serious accidents, hazardous spills, and numerous public safety events. In recent years, John took an active role in leading conservation wardens in the COVID-19 pandemic response initiatives, as well as the civil unrest response at our state capitol. Lastly, John has excellent communication skills. He navigates messaging carefully and looks for ways to take on leadership roles in simple conversations or when tackling statewide presentations. He is always positive and professional and sets the bar when it comes to clear, consistent communication. I am grateful to the Shikar Safari Club for the recognition of Lieutenant Sinclair's exemplary achievements. At this time, I would like to ask that John Sinclair be allowed to step up and come forward to receive the 2021 Shikar Safari Club International Officer of the Year Award. Thank you. Um, thank you to Shikar Safari Club International. Thank you to Chief Krieger, to my supervisor, Captain Jeremy Plouts, who nominated me, and to the Natural Resources Board. My name is John, as you just learned, um, and I'll keep it short, but um, it's an honor to stand here in front of you all today and to receive this award. I'm humbled. Um, I grew up in southeastern Wisconsin in a major city. I was a city boy. 
I took natural resources for granted, right? I enjoyed the clean air, the clean water. I swam in Lake Michigan. They never gave a thought to who was looking out for those resources. I didn't <laughs> understand what the DNR did. And so I went off to college, studied journalism and communications, not probably a typical career, career path or educational path for someone pursuing a career at the DNR, because I still wasn't pursuing a career at the DNR at that point. It wasn't until my mid-20s that I met a conservation warden and uh, job shadowed him for a few days and realized that protecting people and natural resources was a pretty cool thing, pretty fulfilling thing. And so I feel fortunate that um, a little bit later in life, I discovered the DNR, and now I've been here about 10 years, which is crazy for me to think about. Um, there's two things that just I'm exceptionally thankful for, and that's that the DNR saw value in what I brought, um, even with my maybe non-traditional background. They gave me a chance to use my skills to help the people and resources of Wisconsin, and they, um, they continue to support me as I grow in my career. Second thing that I'm even more thankful for is that every day I get to work with these really passionate, intelligent people, and I get to learn from them. And I mean the whole DNR, I'm not just talking about the world. So it's a pretty amazing place to work, and I'm, I'm honored again. So thank you, all of you. Yeah, that's a good idea. This is the picture with Gary right here. Oh, wonderful. It's a new thing. Oh, absolutely. Hey, Keep it up. Way <laughs> to go, John. Okay, scope statements. Press the board approved the statement of scope of, for board order WM0921 and conditionally approved the public hearing notice and notice of submittal of proposed rules to the legislative council rules clearinghouse for proposed rules affecting chapter NR 8, 10, 11, 12, 17, 18, 19, and 27 related to the 2021 Bureau of Wildlife Management Housekeeping Rule. Staff presenter is Scott Carroll. Go ahead, Scott. Good morning, uh, Chair Kazmierski, Deputy, Deputy Secretary Barry, and members of the board. I am Scott Carroll. I'm the Wildlife Policy Specialist for the Bureau of Wildlife Management. We have before you today uh, a scope statement for WM0921. And as you'll read throughout the scope statement, this is uh, some uh, kind of a semi-annual thing we do in the Bureau of Wildlife Management where we, every two years or so, we build a rule or a scope statement that is just meant to uh, you know, clarify things in code that we find a little bit, or members of the public find confusing and we think needs clarification, updating out uh, incons or inconsistencies with statute or updating uh, out of date language. So if you look in the scope statement, you'll see the word clarify a lot. And that's pretty much what this is doing is non uh, really substantive changes to uh, administrative code. Uh, and this is a scope statement, so we don't have any rule language written, nor can we until this is approved, but uh, we don't foresee any this rule going into effect and probably till next year at the earliest. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. First, move to approve. Second. Oh. <clears throat> Discussion? Go ahead, Phil. I was a little curious with number two, uh, there under the summary uh, statement, clarify that free bonus farmland antlerless deer permits must be used on private land? Yeah, so in code, we offer farmers a free bonus permit. This is- I'm aware, I'm aware of that, yeah. Yeah, this is not the, the ones that are issued with your license, the, the um, you know, whatever based off what the CDAC recommends that when you buy a deer license, you're issued automatically 
like say three or four antlerless permits. If you're a farmer, you're given a free one. And you know the idea is that this is a way to address potentially wildlife damage on your property as a farmer. And what we found is that going through the registration data is that these are sometimes being used on public lands. And so I think the idea behind them was that they would use them on their own property to uh, if there is wildlife damage going on. So that's what we'll be potentially bringing forward in a, in a rule. So that isn't clear in the in the code. No? It does not require that. It's I think this was written before we went to a private public tag issuance of the free. Uh, farmland bonus tag. So it wasn't updated when that rule was updated okay. to, you know, when we were specifying uh, private or public on those analyst tags. Thank you. Any other questions? So let's motion to approve. Um, second, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 No, motion carries. Thank you. <clears throat> And this would be 4C, request that the board approve the scope statement of scope for the board order DG0422 and conditionally approve the public hearing notice and notice of submittal of proposed rules to the legislative clearinghouse for proposed rules affecting chapter NR140 related to setting numerical standards to minimize the concentration of polluting substances in groundwater. Cycle 10 bacteria. Staff presentation by Bruce Franke, Groundwater Section Chief. Go ahead, Bruce. Good morning, Chair uh, Kazmierski, Deputy Secretary Barry, and members of the board. Again, my name is Bruce Reinick, Groundwater Section Chief. Uh, thanks for reading off all that for me this morning to get through the um, name of the um, um, scope statement that I'm here asking for approval. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, awesome. So we're here asking for a scope statement approval. As you mentioned, this is for, uh, to revise NR140 um, to set uh, certain groundwater standards. For this one in the scope statement, we asked for two parameters, um, E. coli and total coliform bacteria. And what we're looking to do is to match some information um, about a better indicator parameter for bacteria contamination. EPA came out with um, a, a revised rule for public water systems back in 2016, and we're going to make NR140 batch that. So we're looking to add E. coli bacteria as an indicator parameter, which is currently not in the rule, and transition total coliform bacteria, which is still useful but no longer the gold standard per EPA as an indicator parameter to allow us more flexibility when we sample water and figure out responses that are necessary. Um, just to kind of go over, you know, per CDC, there are a number of um, leading causes of bacterial illness, waterborne disease in the US. Many of those come from interactions with surface water, but occasionally also uh, from drinking water. And that's why we have these rules. The US has some of the safest drinking water in the world. And these are kind of the reasons why, but there are possible contamination that you probably heard of like E. coli can also happen in food. Norovirus outbreaks, you probably have heard of those happening fairly often on cruise ships and whatnot. Also, if you do a lot of backpacking or outdoor resource activities, cryptosporidium and giardia, you know, are, are issues that you have to be careful of when you're out. Um, but the intent of these rules is to protect you when you're drinking water at your home uh, to avoid some of the, you know, violent illness and occasionally life-threatening effects that can happen from ingesting bacteria. So we did have a preliminary hearing on this rule um, scope statement on April 22nd. Um, two outside uh, people attended. One was supportive of the rule. Uh, uh, WMC also submitted written comments. They were concerned that uh, DNR remained focused on just total coliform and E. coli. And that is our intent. And with that, uh, do you have any questions? Questions? And move. We'll see, request DG0422. Support. Okay. 
Um, well, I did have one question. Um, so you're saying that in a typical water test, we're going to test for these other bacteria now. Um, what does that add to the cost to me as a private well owner if I want to get my well tested? Do you have any idea of that at this point in time? We do. We surveyed um, a number of leading laboratories in the state. And uh, fortunately, private well owners are going to benefit from the fact that this is already transitioned for public well systems because all the uh, six or seven laboratories that we sampled they do it stepwise. They run total coliform. And if that's positive, they run E. coli and let you know that. And it's all for the one price. So there may be some labs out there that do it stepwise and separate prices, but all of the main labs that we use already just for one price, you get both if you need both. Okay. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Hearing none opposed, uh, the motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you. So we're gonna go to 4D. And miscellaneous item, elk herd update and approval of the 2022 elk season quotas. Um, PowerPoint is by Josh Spiegel, wildlife biologist. Is Josh here or is he remote? Uh, remote, Chair. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead Josh. Uh, good morning, Chair Kazmierski, Deputy Secretary Barry, and the rest of the board members. Uh, Josh Spiegel here from uh, Hayward, Wisconsin, a wildlife biologist working with the Northern Elk Herd. Um, as, uh, uh, as previously mentioned, we'll be talking about a, a brief uh, herd update here, as well as the 2022 <clears throat> herd update. So uh, thank you for, for switching slides here. Briefly, the, the 2022 Central Herd, uh, we'll give you a quick update on that status down there. Uh, Pre-calving, that herd is uh, about 100 animals in size and uh, is projected to be post-calving about 130 or so here in the year 2022. Uh, moving further north, um, our pre-calving population estimate for 2022 within the northern elk zone is about 259 animals. Um, this, uh, this was kind of part of our, our projection through Os Office of Applied Sciences as well as ground truthing by uh, DNR field staff. Uh, we came out uh, right about the same ballpark number. Uh, so the 259 is, is where we're sitting in 2022. Uh, our herd status as we move forward, um, we project to be at about 336 animals in the north, totaling about 465 animals statewide for the year 2022 post calving. Um, you, can, you can see on the graph illustrated on the right there, we, we are projecting a little bit of a plateau this year. Uh, we've had a, a few unique uh, uh, things occurring with the herd, primarily the fact that we are losing a, a large cohort of, of older cows. Uh, a lot of these cows that were born in the early to mid 2000s, they're kind of in that 18, 19, uh, 20 plus year old category. So Numerically speaking, uh, we have lost a few of those over the last couple of winters, primarily this past year timeframe. Um, that's not uncommon as, as typically speaking, animals usually in the wild, uh, uh, those breeding cows, uh, sorry about that, um, typically die around that, that age of 20 years old or so. Um, so you can see uh, dating back to a few previous uh, timeframes, kind of that mid 2000s, uh, right around 2010 uh, and then around 2013 we did have previous years where there were slight dips um, this isn't uncommon for for small herd uh, group sizes of any animal uh, so um, in the long term or the the two year we are still uh, above or right at about that 10 percent growth at at a little over 11 percent total so uh, next slide please a uh, quick review of previous elk hunting seasons here. So uh, again, the, the year 2022 marks the fifth uh, elk hunt that Wisconsin uh, would be holding for resident only hunters. 
Um, the first two years, 2018 and 2019, uh, the board approved a quota of 10 tied to a 5% total population rule. Uh, in the year 2019, that rule was amended uh, and, and allowed to, uh, to have a quota estimate or a quota um, approval uh, based on the best science possible and what's best for our, our elk herds. Um, the DNR and Natural Resources Board recognize this need and, uh, and again, push that through in, in 2019. Um, looking at some of the applications, uh, early on, we had about 40,000 individuals apply for that very first year. Uh, we kind of expected a, a slight bump in year one as, as it was a, a new first time experience for, for a lot of our hunters. Um, we've seen that drop down to, uh, on average, about 25,000 over the last three years. Uh, we expect uh, about the same amount of applications for the year 2022 um, uh, and moving forward, we'll continue to work with, uh, with our communication staff uh, to, to um, offer that opportunity to as many people as possible. Um, kind of looking at the, the overall harvest here, um, in all we've harvested about 31 elk or 31 elk in total. 14 of those have been through tribal members. Uh, 16 of those were through legal state harvest. And unfortunately we did have one in the year 2018 that, uh, uh, that was a violation, but still a, a harvest by a Wisconsin elk hunter. So um, kind of looking forward here, we're, we're hoping to have another successful hunt uh, in 2022. So uh, we can go ahead and, and move forward. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit of background on the quota setting process, very similar to that of 2021. Um, field staff and Office of Applied Science work together throughout the year, you know, 365 days on collection of, of data for the, for the elk themselves and, and uh, the status of our herds. Um, the elk population data collected includes uh, Snapshot Wisconsin, in which we do our, our bull analysis. We break down the age classes, age classes between spikes, raghorns, and bulls, just giving us an idea of, of where that uh, percentage is across the, the bull cohort. Um, additionally speaking, we, we do various things, including field observations, surveys, uh, our collaring efforts, which uh, allow us many different things, not only from a population standpoint, but but also elk use without, uh, within the ranges, uh, habitat use, movements, um, daytime versus nighttime activities, et cetera. So uh, all of this data is compiled um, and uh, uh, ends up in the hands of uh, our Office of Applied Science where they uh, create a population model and uh, ultimately a quota projection that, uh, uh, that we've been running out about a four year window. So. Um, that goes to Office of Applied Science, and then the, uh, the outcome from that goes through the decision-making process, which starts out at the Elk Advisory Committee. That's uh, both an internal and external agency committee with non-agency partners as well. So um, at that ground level, we have the discussions of, of what we feel is important for our herd, uh, not only from a hunting aspect, but also from a management and uh, uh, other aspects across the state of Wisconsin. Um, uh, at that, uh, at that process, that quota then goes up through the wildlife leadership team, through the Bureau of Wildlife Management and to the department until it comes to today for the, uh, approval upon the board. So the elk advisory committee, uh, looking back to 2021, uh, had, um, had created these four management objectives for creating our harvest uh, quotas um, and, and really the projections with the quota in all. Um, starting in 2021, we used this four point objective scale or, or uh, a four point objective process. Um, the first of which is to maintain a bull to cow ratio of at minimum 40, uh, 40 bulls for every 100 cows on the landscape. Uh, again, this is for the Northern Elk Range. Um, so in 2022, we're currently sitting at about 40 bull or 46 bulls for whatever one for every 100 cows on the landscape. Um, the second point here is to increase the total bull population. So uh, in 2022, again, we have uh, projected 80 bulls post calving. Uh, so this would uh, include some of the recruitment from last year's calves uh, moving into that spike category. 
Uh, additionally speaking, still tied to that bull population standpoint, we also want to focus on increasing the mature bull population within our bull cohort itself. So in 2022, we're looking at about 34 mature bulls on the landscape uh, within our, our uh, Northern Elk Zone herd. Uh, lastly, the, the fourth um, objective that we focus on over this four year period is to maintain a 10% growth population over a two year period. In 2022, we have a projection of uh, 336 uh, post calving elk within the Northern Elk Zone. Uh, our 2021 was about 332 and our 2020 was about 321 or uh, um, I apologize, uh, right around 300. So we're, uh, we're continuing to move forward with that. So in, in a two year standpoint, we're, we're again, right in that 10% ballpark. So um, next slide, please. So that moves us to our 2022 quota. Um, the recommended quota from the department is eight bull elk, eight legal bull elk uh, to be split four and four between state licensed hunters and Ojibwa tribal members uh, hunting within the ceded territory of Northern Wisconsin. Um, on the state uh, draw side of things, we'd be looking at uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation exercising their last year of a, a five-year effort to raffle one tag off to uh, promote elk hunting through funding raised in the state of Wisconsin. The remaining three would be drawn at random in early June uh, for state licensed hunters. Uh, at that point in time, all state licensed hunters after the RMEF draw and Wisconsin uh, license holder draw uh, would go through an orientation process uh, throughout their activities and scouting, et cetera. Um, uh, looking forward here um, with the eight bull quota, uh, this would be uh, very similar to what we projected in 2021. We're following kind of the same pattern here. Um, you can see on the graph on the upper right hand side, uh, this eight bull quota offers a, a, a really flexible and, and good option for improving both the, the total bull cohort, kind of the <coughs> combination of the dark blue and light blue, light blue as well as that, uh, that main mature bull cohort uh, labeled in the, in the dark blue there. So that continues to increase across that four year time frame. Um, if you wanna break it down a little bit further on those uh, next four years at an eight uh, quota harvest, um, you can see that uh, the estimated population in total, the total bull population and mature bull cohort all continue to increase at a pretty decent size across that. So um, that's gonna continue to improve that, uh, that whole herd status. Uh, additionally speaking, the total bulls per 100 cows uh, remains about the same across the board there. Um, with that, I'd, I'd like to kind of open it up to the, to the board members for any questions. Any questions from the board? Bill? Yes. Um, I'm, it's interesting uh, with, your, with your plan that you, that you don't talk about how you're going to improve uh, the death loss and the calves that are born. And also, I'm, I'm curious, I understand in the Clam Lake area, there are breakaway groups that are doing better than the main group, and it seems to be tied to their access to uh, better grazing. Uh, can you speak to those issues? Sure, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, Bill, would you be able to re repeat your first question? I didn't quite hear it clear enough. Okay, um, the, I, I'm okay on my dairy operation. Uh, our death loss in calves is between one and two percent. Uh, that's important to us because that's our future. Uh, if and it, it holds true with the elk herd as well. The, the calves are your future. And you, and you have a pretty hefty death loss in the calves. And you, you don't speak to that at all in your, in your plan. Okay, yeah, thank you for clarifying your, your question there. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, again, this is, this is a wild population too. Uh, we, we fully understand that the calves are the next generation. You know, all your younger animals are the next generation. And uh, um, so what we're doing actively right now is continuing to improve habitat as much as we can. 
Um, I know you had mentioned kind of the second part of your second question was, you know, that grazing habitat, et cetera. Um, so some of our outlying groups uh, in that sense do have uh, additional uh, grazing options. They've settled into areas, um, some with agriculture, some without, but uh, we are working both with forestry and other landowners to improve that. Uh, I know both the central and northern zones are starting to implement larger scale uh, habitat burns, you know, where we're treating uh, large acreages at the same time. So all this ties right back into that calves. We're trying to create that parturition area, something with high forage that those cows can be uh, highly productive both pre and post calving. Uh, additionally speaking, this ties right into the um, kind of that uh, uh, mixture of, of timber sales, primarily aspen uh, sales up here in northern Wisconsin. We're trying to, to roll that over, get that thick habitat, that thick cover moving forward. Um, as part of this process, uh, we are actually uh, implementing as of this year, uh, a new calving study or, or similar to previous years, but um, we're GPS collaring calves. Uh, we actually started this weekend, the searching process. And hopefully this is gonna give us a better understanding of our current calving survival, as well as the long-term survival of these animals. So um, we're trying to get a better handle on that at this point in time, because the, the last in sequence uh, years that we did this was kind of the early 2000s wrapping up about 2013. So uh, about 10 years ago. So um, the idea behind everything again is create that habitat. You know, it's a, it's a good mixture of cover uh, as well as forage. You know, those, those calves need uh, need that cover to be protected from uh, from early onset predators, and then the the habitat to keep them away from dangerous areas such as uh, roadways or or anything else that might uh, might put them at risk. So um, we're working on a process right now to to get a better understanding of that process. And, and then one more question, if I may. Sure. Sure. Um, your your goal is to increase population by 10% a year. Uh, that, that's very clear. But what is the ultimate goal uh, for the state of Wisconsin? Um, I'm, I'm guessing you're asking about goal numbers. Number, or, or number, just the, yes. Yeah. So um, within, the, within the northern zone here, which we're looking at is 1,400 elk. So again, right now we're, we're estimated about 336. Um, so we're working towards that. There is a, a little bit of plus or minus depending on, on how we see that population settling into our zone. Uh, but we're, we're looking at getting there um, as, as fast as we can, but al also uh, offering our hunters the opportunity uh, to, take, uh, you know, to take that uh, hunting aspect forward. Additionally speaking, uh, uh, you know, related to the hunting aspect and ultimate goal uh, side of things is to provide that tourism aspect. Um, you know, while hunters are out there pursuing elk about five weeks, a little over five weeks in a given year, uh, the tourism industry and, and uh, um, the local communities that, that house elk, uh, they're having people come visit that area about 365 days a year. And on top of that, like everything else, the, the virtual social media aspect to it has exploded. Um, you can see all these, these different aspects getting shared uh, across the board on a regular basis. So we're, we're trying to you know, um, get to that ultimate goal of 1400 elk plus or minus uh, a little bit with that, but get there while we're trying to balance opportunity both from a, a hunting recreation and a non-hunting recreation standpoint. Anybody else? Terry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Josh, you mentioned the goal for the northern region. What's the numerical goal for the central region? And is there a plan in place for any hunting in the central region? Uh, yeah, so the, the central region, as of right now, uh, our current 2012 plan amendment that includes the Black River Falls area has a goal of 390 elk. Um, within that plan, uh, you know, it's very similar to the Northland laying out the same, uh, same stuff. Um, within that central zone, we do have a target goal of about 150 elk that will start having that discussion of an elk hunting season. So again, we're, we're projecting about 130 this year uh, and, and then we'll start uh, projecting that hunting discussion right around 150 elk. 
Go one ahead. additional question, uh, Josh, you mentioned about uh, this will be the fifth year with the Rocky Mountain Foundation. What happens after the fifth year? <clears throat> so after the fifth year, um, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, they actually uh, mentioned this at our, uh, at our Elk Advisory Committee meeting here back in March. Um, they're, they're willing to exercise that fifth year option. Uh, from that point on, all tags will become uh, raffle drawn for state license holders through that state licensing system. Thank you. Anybody else? Bill? Bill? Go ahead. Gosh, uh, recognizing the success some of those smaller uh, family groups have had in the northern zone, the ones that have broken off and moved into maybe better locations, had more successful reproduction. Is there any intent on the department to try and encourage or accelerate that process of the elk spreading out and using the full extent of their range? Yes, there is. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Bill, for bringing that up. So within both our current management plan and efforts we plan on using into the future, uh, we plan on using the assisted dispersal process not only to move elk into areas where we, uh, where we see suitable habitat, but also to use it as, uh, as an effort to reduce any, uh, any concern areas. So um, winter trapping is, is extremely effective here within the state of Wisconsin, uh, primarily up here in the north due because the, the snow conditions that we do get. So we're able to, uh, to work with those animals to move them into location. So not only can we move animals um, uh, into high, uh, high priority habitat areas that should uh, support the elk, but we can also reduce problem areas at the same exact time. One additional question, Josh, in looking at the population uh, graphs that you put up earlier, and the Northern zone has been a uh, much longer managed elk herd. You see the graph going up and gradually rising in numbers. There have been dips along the way. The areas where the population has accelerated the most coincide with those times when we brought in elk from outside the state and we introduced, uh, you know, a new genetic material. We brought in additional numbers of elk, and the curve goes up rather quick when that happens. My question is, what is your feeling about the uh, the potential of just natural reproduction of the elk that we have in Wisconsin. Do we have a realistic chance to achieve that goal of 10% average growth per year, just based on the calf production of the elk that we've got in the state? Uh, yes, I, I believe that's, uh, that's a true statement, Bill. Primarily for the point that even before we, we did the introductions in 2017 and 2019 in the North, we were still on pace in that 10% ballpark. Um, I, I know that uh, um, you know a big dip in there was at 2013, um, 2013 winter, which obviously did take its toll on, on some elk. That was an extremely uh, rare winter to say the least. Um, typically speaking from a, a winter severity standpoint, elk are, are very, very hardy, much hardier than a deer. So um, that winter aspect is, is uh, very unique when it comes to 13. Uh, outside of that time frame, that uh, population growth stayed at that at or above that 10%. So we want to make sure that that, that continues onward. Um, additionally speaking, with the, with the insertion of the uh, Kentucky genetics, we're hoping to see if, if there's you know, an average weight increase in these calves to, um, to potentially increase survival. You know, a big healthy calf is uh, uh, should have a better chance of surviving, whether that's um, uh, a better hiding mobility, advancement of, of size, et cetera. So uh, kind of all these aspects together on top of that habitat, uh, uh, being the habitat is the, the big one, you know, uh, having the coverability for both adults and calves to, to hide from predation, get away from predation, uh, the increased forage, both uh, across the, the timber aspect and the forage aspect. Um, you know, we're, we're hoping to have that diversity, you know, not only are we doing the historic wildlife openings, both planted and maintained, but uh, again, using fire on the landscape to do large block grazing scales with natural forage in them. So um, uh, all this together should put us right on track for, 
for staying uh, at that 10% uh, growth goal. Thank you, very informative. <laughs> I move, the, uh, I move to present a statement of support. Motion to second. I did have one quick question for Josh. So, uh, Josh, you, you didn't mention anything about uh, the nutritional concerns that you have up there and going out of state to uh, seek some knowledge on that. Could, could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, so um, one thing that we have been looking at is, is making sure that we have the forage available for our wildlife. And again, this is, uh, or for our elk, I should say more specifically. So this is something we've been uh, looking into some of the other eastern, uh, eastern elk states, what they have for, for available forage on their landscape. And, and to be honest, Wisconsin is actually one of the better ones for diversity um, of, of available forage. You know, Aspen being a primary food source uh, up here in the north specifically, um, Aspen, while, while kind of dwindling in general, uh, we're right in the heart of Aspen country in that greater Sawyer, Price, Ask, uh, Ashland, Bayfield County area. So uh, promoting that, uh, creating more availability on the landscape, and then offering that patchwork to uh, to not put our animals at risk, you know, um, uh, giving them the ability to move from site to site and have many feeding options. Um, we're hoping that the diversity of forage uh, helps with some of that, uh, Chair Kaz. Um, you know, we, we do a lot with our, our planted and maintained forage openings, uh, maintaining those annually. We, we do mowing and reseeding efforts as needed to try to create a um, a, uh, a diverse uh, a layout for grasses, forbs, and other browsable uh, uh, vegetation for elk. Uh, additionally speaking, like, uh, like I previously mentioned, uh, we're working with local uh, property managers, you know, up here in the north, it's the Flambeau River State Forest, which is primarily a forested property, um, to create some of this open habitat through the use of fire. Um, Kimberly Clark Wildlife Area is another one that's historically been maintained for sharp tailed grouse. We're transitioning that property to, uh, to include, include um, a lot of elk use uh, on that, uh, that location as well. So we're planning on maintaining that open ground with fire. We also have other partners like Sawyer County Forest that's doing the same. Um, we're in the process, we've, we've now completed, uh, I believe it's four total burns on Sawyer County Forest within the elk management area to promote vegetation forage in those areas versus just having timber as, as the uh, forage type there. So uh, we're cool. working to diversify that, uh, that forage class across the range. So you're acknowledging there's a nutritional shortfall currently um, in, the, in that elk area. Um, and so I have, that's basically saying the biological carrying capacity has been met. And so are we approaching it? Because building habitat takes years, okay? So what are we doing now when, when we have a wolf or a elk population that's above its biological carrying capacity to bring that population to the carrying capacity that exists at this time. Um, well, I I wouldn't say that we've hit our biological carrying capacity. Um, we may have in the areas that the elk are currently using. Um, so uh, again, we're trying to not only improve that localized habitat, uh, i.e., as much habitat work as we can every single summer, including creation of new stuff and maintenance of old stuff, uh, but also trying to get a lot of those timber sales going. Um, you know, uh, I think many of the board members are, um, are aware of like the good neighbor authority process. So not only uh, have the, the uh, feds and uh, state foresters been in cooperation for creating improved timber habitat across the, the national forest, but uh, outside of the GNA, the U.S. Forest Service is also improving and, and ramping up their timber sales. There's a lot of stuff that's been on the books for many years uh, that unfortunately wasn't able to be cut. So we're, we're going, we're, we're past that time frame um, and we're creating that new habitat. So we're seeing our elk using many more of those areas. So uh, instead of the, the core localized areas, they're starting to spread out, range out further, use larger habitat uh, uh, blocks and, and ranges in size. So I think uh, 
um, I think the idea is, is similar to what um, uh, what member Bill Smith brought forward was we need we need these elk to move further and use all habitat versus just the stuff in their localized home ranges. Okay, I have a follow-up uh, question, Josh. This is an important question that Taz asked, in my opinion, because the carrying capacity of, of the landscape determines the management of the species. So I understand we just got done saying to us as far as going forward, but today, now, next three years, do you believe that we're at the carrying capacity where the current herd is located? If the answer is yes to that, do you believe that the herd will, will migrate to other areas during that time where we have starvation, high predation, because they are staying around an area that can't support? That's a good question, I like that answer. Yeah, no. Um, so my answer to that is yes. We are seeing them range out a little bit further. Um, you know, the cow calf group home ranges are spreading. They're using areas that historically they haven't. Now, again, it's a slow process. They have their areas that they're familiar with and, and comfortable with, but they are expanding at the same time. Um, the second part to that, or, or another uh, another part to that, um, uh, is is the idea that these cow calf groups or these animals are, are dying over winter. So um, it's actually very, very rare. Um, so I did bring forward that some of these animals were lost to, to winter severity and, and body condition. Again, these were all animals over the age of 18 years old, uh, uh, with the exception of one. One was 16 with, with a long-term injury, uh, a 16-year-old cow that lived 11 years with a broken right rear leg. So this animal was able to sustain her body for an additional 11 years after the injury uh, in an area or in a time frame when the habitat was just moving forward. We're well past that standpoint. So um, the landscape can support our elk. Um, that's, that's not a question. Our young animals are surviving. Uh, we, don't, we don't see winter severity impacts or uh, uh, animal loss over winter um, due to lack of nutrition. Um, is there uh, any, again, Josh, Josh, is there any artificial feeding at all going on by the state for these elk? The, the only artificial feeding that occurs is when we have our winter trapping sites out. So when we're, when we're attempting to draw them into a site for, uh, for research needs. Okay. Thank you. Marcy, I think your hand was up. Sorry to, sorry to. No, that's okay. I think I may have found the answer. Um, it, it's safe to assume that you, after the harvest, um, the bulls that are taken are tested for CWD and any other diseases. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So um, in, in regards to CWD, we still do offer hunter service testing throughout the uh, uh, both elk ranges, as well as any, uh, any viable mortality. So anything that we encounter throughout the year, uh, if it's uh, 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 natural or unknown mortality, something out on the landscape, if there's a viable sample there that is collected and submitted. Uh, additionally, with that, we do the same with uh, vehicle collisions and our hunter harvest. So um, both state licensed and tribal hunters do submit um, samples for, uh, for not only disease testing, but for general health testing as well. Um, I know our, our state veterinarian, Lindsay Long, has, has made an effort to, uh, to be very progressive in, um, in watching our elk herd and, and how it relates to elk in the eastern U.S. So um, we have uh, an archive of many samples that our hunters uh, collect and that staff collect when, when we have field uh, necropsies as well. Thank you. And Terry, uh, Josh, this isn't pertinent to the motion, but uh, how are we getting along with our neighbors in the central region? Um, I know uh, uh, Scott Repke and, and some others have been uh, very active in, in talking with uh, different partners and uh, uh, folks down in that central area. There's been a lot of outreach moving forward and, and uh, discussions continue to be ongoing with, with our neighbors down there. So we got the good neighbor policy down there too, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, do I have a, I have a motion? Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, everyone. Uh, here at, uh,
E, and that would be land donation, Devil's Lake State Park, Sauk County, two land donation, Glacial Habitat Restoration Area, Winnebago County. Staff presenter is Jim Lemke, Real Estate Section Chief. Jim. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Kazmierski, uh, Deputy Secretary Barry, and the rest of the members of the NRB. Uh, my name is Jim Lemke, and I'm the Real Estate Section Chief for the DNR. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning, as it always is, to present to you for your consideration 4E, which are two land donations. One involves 80 acres within Devil's Lake State Park from the Nature Conservancy, and the other is a donation from Ducks Unlimited. Both donations highlight the important relationships we have with these two conservation partners. Both properties fall within approved NRB project boundaries, adjoin existing department lands, both will be open to all five MBOAs and are located close to large population centers. The first donation located at Devil's Lake involves 80 acres located within the bearable bluffs of Devil's Lake State Park. Uh, the property was purchased by the Nature Conservancy last year when the DNR purchased the adjacent 220 acres. The Nature Conservancy purchase of the land was to not only protect the conservation values of this land, but also to specifically support the state's acquisition of this important property. The Nature Conservancy used a statewide stewardship grant of $245,000 to help support the cost of the $665,000 acquisition. With this the donation, the department will be protecting almost 300 acres of public lands embedded with, within uh, Wisconsin's most popular state park. The second property being donated is owned by Wetland American Trust, also known as Ducks Unlimited, and is located in the boundary of the Glacial Habitat Restoration Area. This restoration area involves four different counties that take a regional landscape approach to wildlife management by restoring and maintaining wild prairie grass habitat for waterfowl, pheasant, and non-game songbirds. I had the opportunity to join Ducks Unlimited to visit this property earlier this spring. It's really a beautiful piece of property. It's located on a dead-end quiet country road with restored rolling prairie grasses, pockets of wetlands, inland ponds, all thanks to the restoration efforts of Ducks Unlimited. The land includes over 4,600 feet of shoreline on Rush Lake. A duck, a Ducks Unlimited has also installed a public parking lot and overall has donated $100,000 in labor costs and expense of restoring this area prior to requesting donation to the state of Wisconsin. The property will be managed consistent with other surrounding GHRA properties and will consist of mowing, prescribed burns, occasional herbicide treatments to counteract invasive species. Ducks Unlimited has assured me they intend to play an active role in support of DNR's long-term management plans. And with that, Mr. Chair, I respectfully seek the board's approval on 4E, acceptance of the 80-acre donation from the Nature Conservancy for Devil's Lake State Park, along with 171 acres being donated from Wetland American Trust for the Glacial Habitat Restoration Area, along with an expression of appreciation to be made part of the official records of the Natural Resource Board. So Mr. Chair, with that, any questions? Thank you, Jim. Any questions from the board? I, Bill. You know, more and more we think and, and talk about habitat management. And as we acquire these properties, um, I know there's a lot of thought put into, you know, how to manage them, but are, are you specifically looking at a management plan or a habitat management plan for various uh, wildlife uh, uh, that, that exists there? Uh, is my, do you understand my question? Yes, yes, I, I certainly do, Bill. It's a, it's a great question. And I'm not the management expert, but I do have Eric Loebner here from the Bureau of Wildlife. Mr. Chair, with your permission, maybe Eric uh, can address uh, that question, Bill, if that'd be all right with the board. That would be fine with me. Eric? Chair Kazmierski, uh, Deputy Secretary Barry, and rest of the board. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you're going to hear uh, later today when I talk a little bit about our uh, restructuring that we're looking at. That is the, one of the key areas that we're looking at. How do we take, we have individual species management plans that says, all right, this is the habitat work you need to do in these areas of the state geographically. How do we take all of that and ultimately create a statewide management plan that would tell us, all right, as you do this on this property, this is exactly what you need to do. Because right now, how it works is our biologists have a pheasant management plan. They have a rough grouse management plan, waterfall management plan. 
they, they got to take that and digest it down. And what we want to do is get to a point where we have an individual that really helps oversees that, sets metrics on that, and helps us carry that forward. We're doing it now, but it's a little bit more, um, I'll just say maybe more piecemeal, but um, certainly we look at those plans, but this will really help us hit those metrics a little bit better. Thank you. Follow up question. Don't leave. Sorry. <laughs> uh, under the uh, glacial habitat restoration area, Winnebago County, what does the DNR have in our budget for maintenance of this property right now? Yeah, so right now, so how it works with all of our land uh, management activities, we have a spreadsheet basically that takes all of our land management and it sorts it out now by different habitat types. Um, we have a whispers has all of the data in there. So I don't know that number right off the top of my head, but how it works is we have numbers that associate for each of those areas, um, those habitat types that we apply then to the properties that we have. And then through our work planning process, we set a budget for each of those individual. It starts really at the local, I would say, work unit. So the county, you know, and then it steps up to an area that steps up to a district. And so I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but I can tell you, we've been able with a lot of the increases that we've seen with uh, PR coming in, as well as like in this situation, you couldn't ask for anything better, right? You have a turnkey property, right? It's like a turnkey house. We can pretty much walk in, thanks to Ducks Unlimited, and basically not have to do the restoration. They've already done it. The other good thing about this restoration work that they've done, um, they've done wetland restorations that are uh, less labor intensive than what you might experience with a, an impoundment situation. So when you do a ditch plug or you do a scrape, that habitat, which is very beneficial for individual um, breeding pairs of ducks, uh, specifically adjacent to Rush Lake in this situation, and those costs are very low um, compared to, let's just say, uh, an impoundment where you've got to potentially put millions of dollars into it just to establish the impoundment at the get-go. Not to say there isn't a place for impoundments, but just in this situation, it's it's very much a turnkey property. So I can get you the specific numbers, Terry. So I, I guess my bigger question about it um, is when we take on a new project, how much fluff do we have in the budget for this year? Yeah to be able to maintain a new project yeah. so or, like, a, or a incremental increase in a project. Right, so like in this situation where we already work planned for 2023, which is our next fiscal year. And so we've work planned in the expectation that this property is gonna be able to, we're gonna to need to be managing it. Um, like I said, these initial years right now that, that the work is already done is a lot lower. And so it kind of ebbs and flows over time. It's not like I would say, okay, you're going to get two hundred dollars. I'm just throwing yeah. numbers up mm -hmm. to do the habitat work infinitum on that property because it, it isn't quite that way. It really ebbs and flows over time based on what their needs. The other thing that we're looking at doing. So we, as I mentioned, we have right now our PR <coughs> and Robertson allocations from the federal government are the highest that um, near the highest that they've ever been. And so we've been able to tap into that money it cycles through the program, as well as we've been very active with a lot of different grants. So we bring that money in on a, sometimes on a case by case basis. This is a general property. So we have a, an acreage score that shows up in our, um, da our database. I don't wanna get into too much details here, but um, that's kind of how it works. And then that, that number ultimately that we have coming through based on our habitat management work ultimately leads to our, our budget allocations. So we're in, we're in good shape. So right we're now. not going to rob money from another no. project to take care of this project. No, right, now, Thank right you. now we're doing good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question, though, for Mr. Lemke. Okay, Terry. <laughs> Morning, Jim. Morning. I'm learning as we go. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's really important for the board and the public to know that these donations are, are fantastic. I mean, we're very, very fortunate as a department, as a state, to have all these uh, wonderful organizations that are giving us stuff. But also to understand that part of what they're giving, we already paid for. Because in many of these instances, we've used grant money, we've used Knowles money to buy this stuff through their process. So people should understand that, yeah, it's a great donation, but we already gave them some of this money for them to be able to donate it to us. 
I hope everybody follows that. Yeah. I do, but I see that as seed money that has encouraged a much greater donation and an overall benefit to the state. I think it's just a great partnership. Oh, absolutely. No, I agree, Bill, but people have to understand that the taxpayers have paid for some of this land already. <laughs> And move approval for both. Move approval. Support. Second. Okay. And second from Marcy. Thanks. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And I think it's time. Look at that. We're actually a little ahead of schedule. It's time for our 15 minute break. And uh, We'll see you back here at 10 10. <clears throat>
I'll be there to order. Can you hear me? I don't know who's coming. <laughs> we didn't start yet. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, everybody's yep, to come right. for. Okay, um, now we're going to go to open forum. Uh, testimony that pertains to topics not on the meeting agenda or not in litigation at approximately 10 15 a.m. or following break. Please refer to pages four and five of the agenda for required pre registration information and protocol. Um, we have one public appearance. The speaker will have three minutes to give their testimony. Please keep in mind that testimony that threatens, intimidates, or makes disparaging comments about board members, department staff, or other members of the public is unacceptable and will not be allowed. The board welcomes citizens' input on matters of natural resources management and department programs and policies. Comments concerning any individual's personal information or personal business are not appropriate and will not be allowed. Uh, we have one speaker, uh, Scott Peter. Are you there, Scott? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Scott Peter. I'm here as a private citizen today, representing myself at the annual Conservation Congress Convention. Chairman Kazmierski addressed the delegates and instructed them to use a phone when contacting the chairman, as opposed to email but he did not clearly explain why. Why did the chairman direct the delegates to use a phone instead of email? You stumbled through your reasoning for using a phone. You did mention contentious era and human rights laws. Please explain the problem for using email when communicating with the chair. Ambiguity in transparency undermines democracy. Any government official who undermines transparency and conspires with other government agencies to do the same is a clear and present danger to democracy. Any attack on transparency in government is an attack on the nation itself. I suggest the board issue a statement committing itself to the public records law. But my real question is, because I'm trying to understand your reasoning, Cass, I'm here seeking clarity. Did the chairman break the law when he conspired with the delegates to bypass the public records law? So that's it. Should I address that? Uh, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Should I address that? Please? All right. Um, six B. Six B. Six B. Uh, results of input on Bureau of Wildlife Management's 2022. Spring Fish and Wildlife Meeting Agenda and Advisory Questions. Scott Carroll. Hey, good morning again. I am Scott Carroll, the Policy Specialist for the Bureau of Wildlife Management. So back in February at this meeting, um, I presented the, to the board as an informational item the questions we plan to ask at the 2022 uh, Wildlife or DNR and WCC Spring Hearings. I'm here today to talk about how they did. Um, let's see. So just a little bit of background. Since it is an even number year, all the questions are advisory. So there isn't any rule for coming from these questions. 
it could be used for future rules, but not anything that would be done due to the legislature legislature being out of session uh, till next January. So we proposed six advisory questions, and unfortunately, one was inadvertently left off the uh, the survey. We didn't notice it. Um, we had a ton of people review it, and uh, we opened it up one I think Tuesday night. It opened up for input, and by Wednesday morning, we already had seven thousand people provide input by the time we noticed that question 15 was off the agenda. So rather than discount those 7,000 people, we just decided since it was Pfizer only, we'll ask again another year. So there's one question that doesn't have any input, just explaining kind of why, what the future for that question is. It's not like we didn't want to ask it or we were afraid to what ask. The question? It was about the um, making the raccoon season one start date rather than a resident and a non-resident. So just, just providing a little background about why there was no input on that question. Um, you know, questions again could be discussed further, and we will plan on we'll, we bring forward all the results from the questions this fall with a variety of stakeholders. And we talk about what we're going to do moving forward. So you may see them again next year in the spring hearings, but you may not. So we'll just kind of see how they go. I won't repeat all the questions. Uh, you, you have them in your packet. You know, they, it's pretty straightforward. I will point out question 11 did confuse some people at the convention. So I just will note, you know, most of the questions were either yes, no, or no opinion. Question 11 asked about increasing the trapping fees. Um, so the first column is yes to an $8 increase. That's what the response is. Second column is yes to a $4 increase. And then the third column is no for no increase at all. So the, the input provided uh, suggested that they were in favor of some increase. You know, it was about 15,000 indicated yes one way or another to an increase where 6,000 said no increase. So it was it did cause some confusion. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that, you know, there was another question I think from the Congress that had a not a yes, no, no opinion. So we had to kind of work through and make sure everybody knew what they were, uh, were voting on. And then, um, you know, then again, question 15 was the one that unfortunately didn't make it. Um, yeah, and that's, that's really all. Uh, if you have any questions, I know uh, just as an aside, all the five questions did receive the majority input or supportive input from the uh, constituents. And then also at the convention, they were all supported by the, the convention to move forward for further discussion. So. Any questions? Scott, the public's uh, information. What's next? What are you guys doing? You, you bring them all forward in the form of uh, proposals for regulation or what happens? So some of the questions that we asked this year did require legislation. So it's just kind of um, providing the, any interested legislator in, you know, uh, Hey, this is what the public thinks about if you would bring this bill potentially. I don't see it's going over the Capitol and like stumping for this, but it's just meant to like give some clarity about where it would where would the public side on if you, they were interested in a bill. <laughs> what we do with the questions that don't require um, any legislation that were supported in the fall this year, we will get together and we'll kind of set our next rules agenda mm -hmm. and the next spring hearing agenda since it is a rule year. You will bring forward a scope statement sometime late fall, early winter. So we bring forward all the questions that were asked this year to a team that in, you know consists of the Congress, law enforcement, uh, customer service, and um, you know maybe other interested parties. And we talk about you know wildlife management. And we say what you know what do we want to do with this? Do we want to ask this again this year? Is this something we maybe want to hold off and get more input on? So you know next this fall we'll be meeting to talk about these questions, and we also put forward a kind of a, a request for staff to see if, if there's any rules that they would want to see move forward this next year. We talk about everything. We also talk about questions that the Congress then um, asked that the department review. So there's you know advisory questions from the WCC that get forward, put forward to uh, species committees, and then they provide their input uh, to staff, and then staff bring them forward potentially as future rules. So we'll we will talk about them, and it's a potential for. I think probably something gets confused. They see a response of you know six and eight percent saying <clears throat> yes. Magically starts to happen. Right. And it's a, this is a process that helps to understand that these questions, along with the citizens' questions, along with the Congress questions, start to get digested and work through the bureaucratic right. snake that we have in this government, which is everywhere. But my point is that this is just one step in the process to make changes. Right. And, and just because it, it got support doesn't mean it will move forward as a rule. It it's just meant to give us guidance on how to move forward potentially in right. the future. So and it is confusing too because. Next year will, will be a rule year. So if it is, 
you know, we will bring a scope statement and it will come to the board as a scope statement and we will bring forward the questions and if it gets supported, we will bring forward a rule shortly after that. So it's a little confusing with how the legislative legislative session lines up, but for advisory only year questions, this is just easy. I think it's important the public to understand if you want to change the size of a muskie on your lake, that this is the process that would be most beneficial to go through because right. they write letters to us and they write letters to the secretary and it's like, this is the best way to do it. Every email or call that I get asking us to do a change, I say, I point them in this direction. I said, this is the right. fastest and best way to do something moving forward. So I do have a question. So if it's a board DNR run question, you said you, and it requires legislation, you said you wouldn't be over there lobbying. For we don't have any plans to go across the street. And then why would we even put the question out? You know, it's something that I think, um, especially for the questions that we asked, it's things that we would like to see and we've had discussions about them. And I think sometimes it, they're hesitant to do things unless they see kind of where the public stands on this. And this is a way to get that public input is just to say, you know, we did have the uh, questions 14 and 16 would require legislation. And I think, it, you know, we, we wanna, we're also interested to see where people stand on this in general. We've asked these questions, particularly, um, you know, in other venues, like on our species surveys. And I think, you know, we've had conversations where we've made recommendations through like memos and stuff through LRB. And, but I do think that unless there maybe is a little hesitancy, unless they know that, hey, there is general support behind this. Yeah. Do we get any legislators to ask us to ask questions? I've never been asked by a legislator to ask a question. I, you know, whether they would or not, it's something we discuss, but I've never, that's never happened on her since I've been in here. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. Nothing to approve there. All right. So we are going to Secretary's Matters. Oh. Sarah? No, you, got, no. you got Meredith. Yep, oh, we got the fish. Yeah, oh, Meredith. 6C. Don't forget the fish lady. Yes. <laughs> no, we won't. All right. Summary of public input on fisheries management advisory questions from the 2022 spring fish and wildlife hearings. Staff presentation by Meredith Penthorn, <coughs> fisheries policy specialist. Go ahead, Meredith. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chair Kazmierski, members of the board, and Deputy Secretary Barry. My name is Meredith Penthorne, and I am the Policy Specialist for the Bureau of Fisheries Management. And I'll just be following up with what Scott mostly already discussed as a result of the results of our Fisheries Management Spring Hearings Advisory questions. Okay. So again, we have an advisory only year this year, and we propose 10 advisory questions, and a majority of the public supported all of our questions. Uh, seven were statewide in nature, and three were a little more regional in nature, and we'll be coordinating with the Minnesota DNR on those. And then for the next steps, we will be discussing these in further detail for the 2023 spring hearings um, as rural questions rather than advisory. Um, and a few of them may also go through additional venues as well, depending on those discussions. Um, so to briefly cover the statewide questions, the first one is a way to standardize the season structure for muskie statewide, and that will help simplify things a little. Uh, questions two and three are walleye related, and those stem from a lot of work that's been done involving the walleye management plan. And then moving on to questions four through seven, uh, four would require uh, small tournaments to self-register with the department so we can get a better idea of how many and how frequently they're being held. Uh, five would allow personal bait harvest of minnows from BHS affected waters. And there's a, been a little bit of confusion on this one um, as to whether it includes the Mississippi River. And yes, it does. So just wanted to clarify that. Um, and then question six and seven would expand uh, sturgeon fishing opportunities on certain waters of the state with stable sturgeon populations um, and all existing uh, hook and line harvest seasons. And then for the last three questions, they all relate to uh, St. Croix River regulations and they would aim to make things a little more consistent with the Mississippi River 
as well as uh, provide some more suitable uh, harvest regulations for catfish and then a new fish refuge to protect spawning fish. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Good questions of the board. No questions for the board. Thank you, Meredith. Cut off easy. <laughs> Thank you, Meredith. All right. Department Secretary's matters. Sarah. Thank you, Chair. All yours. Yep. We're going to first do some retirement recognitions. Uh, first is Julie Amakobi, Land and Facilities Management, 36 years. John Arthur, Parks and Recreation, 32 years. Kathleen Grinsel, Parks and Rec, 33 years. And of course, Lori Ross, who we've already recognized, but um, 21 years. Wendy Weimuller, Remediation and Redevelopment, 36 years. So moved. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Wealth of knowledge going out the door. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Continue, continue? Yeah. Yep. Uh, yes. Any questions on real estate transactions? Okay. If none, Sandy, please come to the podium for your report. <clears throat> All right, good, uh, good morning, it's still morning. Uh, so happy to be here from uh, the far north. Had a great drive down yesterday. Um, it beats driving in the snowstorms that have driven a couple of times. So um, again, thank you for allowing me some time, Deputy Secretary Barry, appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and board members. Uh, my name is Sandy Haas, and as you know, I was appointed by the governor last year to represent Northern Wisconsin on the NRB. I am not on the NRB. I just wanted to make that clear. Um, I am waiting Senate confirmation hearings, as is uh, Shannon Adams. A couple of things I wanted to cover today include um, Emerald Ash Borer um, attendance at CDAC meetings and then uh, sharp-tailed grouse, and then I just have a short closing statement, um, kind of a, of a personal nature. Um, emerald ash borer has been found recently in Ashland and Bayfield counties. April 2022 marks the most recent find in Ashland County. Um, one month before that, they were found in, in uh, Bayfield County. Ash is an important species in Northern Wisconsin, playing a role in stabilizing water levels, stabilizing stream banks, lowering uh, stream temperatures, and has cultural importance to the Ojibwe people. Invasive species continue to be a great threat to our natural resources and a topic this board needs to keep in its forefront. I was able to attend three CDAC meetings, again, as a, as a uh, one of them as a, a community member in that county. Um, the others, just as a, um, the governor's appointee and made clear that I was not on the board. I attended uh, Sawyer, Langlade, and Bayfield County uh, meetings this, this past month. I also spoke with the chairs of Douglas and Iron County CDACs. Those are the uh, uh, CDAC recommendations that were changed last year uh, by the board. Um, each county deliberated, taking all of the information and weighing it based on their county's three-year goal. Langlade, Iron, and Douglas County's goals, the three-year goals are to increase the deer population, Bayfield and Sawyer counties are to maintain their deer population um, over the next three years. Uh, I want to note that um, Bayfield County is going for a record um, in length of meetings. It was just over three hours um, and it deliberated the entire time and um, took into consideration the public comment. So i um, proud to be from that county. I think they do a really good job and um, was able to pass along the message from Chairman Kazmierski that um, the, the uh, public comments should count for more. But I also passed along the message from our training as a CDAC member, former CDAC member, that um, the CDACs were given the charge that it is one piece of the information. So, um, and then uh, for Baker County gave just my personal um, thoughts on, on my own hunt uh, in, that, in that county. And also um, as a person who drives the county every day um, as a teacher in uh, the Drummond area or Southern part of Bayfield County. 
The DNR kicked off the process of updating Wisconsin Sharp-Tailed Grouse Management Plan in the Northwest Sands area. That's something that you've heard me talk about before. It's something of uh, uh, Sharp-Tailed Grouse are, are kind of near and dear to my heart. And I wanna do everything I can to make sure we have a viable population here. Um, the event was recorded. The, the event was last night. So the event was recorded. I was not able to attend, of course. Um, it was recorded and is gonna be available for public viewing. I'm not sure the, the platform that that'll be on, but I was assured there'd be a, a way to view and then add public comment um, because they're collecting that right now. Sand barrens are globally significant and Wisconsin um, is, uh, has an abundance uh, here and I encourage board members to be involved in that process. And finally, just on a, this is my personal note, I am a public school teacher. I'm devastated at the uh, news of the school shooting in Texas yesterday. I've been part of active shooter drills, lockdowns, code blues, code reds with kids. It's pretty traumatic, um, even if it's just a drill. And so I can't imagine what those kids and families and community <laughs> members are going through. Um, I hope, my hope is that we all take time to reflect on this horrific event, remember the lives lost, those injured, um, and those that are left behind, and try to find solutions together. I know every school in the state, um, in, in the nation probably, is uh, thinking about this, offering help to kids, and I just hope that um, you guys consider that um, as we move forward. It has nothing to do with natural resources, but as, as human beings, I think it's something that we need to remember, and thank you for starting with a moment of silence. I appreciate that. Uh, Chairman Kazmersky. Thank you. I have no more items, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Um, and we will go to board members matters. Bill. Yes. Um, I, I, I don't want to bring up, uh, anything controversial, but on the other hand, uh, as per usual, uh, this board has been given the results of the uh, midwinter count of the wolves in the state. And I'm particularly interested in that count this year because of all of the accusations that this board has taken because of the hunt we had in February and, and, and the accusations were that we had devastated the wolf population. So I, I'm, I'm very curious. I'm not even aware for sure if the department did the midwinter count, but I would like to hear what that number is if, if it's available. Would you like that as an informational item on the next meeting? Yes, I would. All right. Terry. Thank you and good morning. Um, I would like the department to bring forward for the board parameters that would be required for a local CDAC to request a split in their county. The reason I'm asking that is I participated as directed by the secretary uh, to observe the CDAC presentations in Florence County, both presentations in March and April, I think they were, both of which unfortunately we ran out of media time. So uh, those of us that were Zooming got cut off at the end of the meeting. I'm not sure how that happens or why that happens, but that happened twice in a row. And it included uh, uh, Jeff Pretzel getting cut off too as the department person in charge of this stuff. Uh, so I think we need to look at why that happens, but I, I would like the department to make those recommendations. So wildlife, wherever they are, Eric, thank you. I would appreciate that. Thank you. That's my request. Okay. Uh, Marcy? Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I don't have anything new. Um, where to, but just a point on the agenda. 
Where does the update from the wildlife reorganization fall in? Uh, well, uh, there was a point of order on that because it wasn't properly noticed on the agenda. So we couldn't move forward with it. We can do the presentation in June. Yeah, we'll do it next month. Okay, thank you. All right. <clears throat> Bill. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I've got another comment, but I'd like to echo on, uh, on Terry's request on CDAC. Um, I wasn't able to participate in a full CDAC hearing, but I did have a chance to talk with leadership from some CDACs in the North afterwards uh, to hear how it went. And I continue to hear uh, concerns about managing very large and very disparate counties with different habitat in different areas and would also like to see uh, parameters that would enable a CDAC to consider a subunit in a county where that's appropriate. I think it would help them considerably in meeting the challenges before them on setting antlerless quotas. So thank you, Terry. Secondly, uh, I had an invitation from Lincoln County to participate in, a, in their annual fundraiser, Lincoln County Sports Club uh, Day. And I was able to attend for uh, several hours and circulate there. And I won't go into details other than to say they have a very active and a large club membership of around 650 people and a very ambitious agenda. They've uh, taken a look at their ranges on the sports club and they're gonna do some significant range renovations. Uh, a lot of people there, enthusiastic, a focus on youth that was everything you could hope it to be for the future of conservation. So just a shout out to Lincoln County and a congratulations on their event. That's it for me, thank you. Okay. And Dr. Preen. I have a question. <clears throat> we had a uh, testimony a couple of months ago on the, from the well drillers and some disconnect that occurred with the department with a very few of the well drillers. Uh, we asked for, I had, I had not received anything from the department, I don't know if the other board members have, on where we're at with that. Um, I'd like to have a report to us where we're at with that. This seems like something can be rectified uh, with everybody in a room sitting together. It's an issue that's now being implemented fairly, but I think prior to that, from what I heard from testimony that it was not identified to the well drillers directly. So I don't want that to go away. I'd like to have that put on agenda. And, and report given to us and hopefully a resolution with a few that got affected by this disconnect. That's it. Okay. I will request it as an agenda. Just put it on it. Well, I have a couple of things that I wanna clean up here. Um, from an organizational standpoint. Um, so there's been some question about the liaisons and the role of liaisons. Um, I kind of like the concept that we did with Bill. Um, if there's a particular item of high interest, then we would assign somebody to that particular issue. Um, However, there's three main areas that we always have to watch closely. And uh, one is real estate. And I asked Terry if he'd be the liaison for that, which you do anyway, so. Um, and so, and it's really important that we get communication with the department to those liaisons. And, as the wildlife liaison before I became chair, um, they were instructed not to talk to me. So I want more open lines of communication. And can I get that promise from the administration? We'll take that under advisement. Thank you, okay. Chair. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm more than happy to do that, uh, Kaz. And I can tell you that uh, uh, real estate folks uh, reach out regularly yep. on real estate issues. And 
And uh, in fact, we had a full day and 450 mile tour last week of two properties that the department is looking at uh, acquiring. So we had a full day of uh, conversation about real estate. Okay, thank you, Terry, for- You bet. And Bill, I'd like to have you continue on as water. Um, the, what you and Doc did on 151 was kind of almost incredible. And it passed without contention because of that communication between the department and the board liaisons, and then the liaisons communicating with the board. So, uh, and water's always a big issue. There's always ongoing stuff. So are you willing to continue that as the liaison yes. for water? And then I'd like to have Doc on fish and wildlife. Um, if he's willing to accept it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And so that's an ongoing thing with those. And if, if a board member has any issue that we think we need to have ahead of time, not before it's dumped in our lap and we have to prove it that day, we need this information as it's a work in progress. Um, just feel free to Give me a call. Um, okay. Am I, are you okay by the flexibility of passing on a certain topic to another board member to be the liaison to the board? Sure. Okay. Sure. You can do that. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure, Marcy. So, is I assume the liaison is not the same as the subcommittee. Last year we talked and it got tabled about something in the operations and I was told that a subcommittee would need to have that. So these liaisons are not the same they as the subcommittee. Uh, okay, so the chair appoints a liaison specific to a project or does this also count for when you said, when you referred to Bill, it wasn't referring to Bill Smith attending an event. It was Bill Smith's work on the fisheries. Bill Fish work on that fisheries issue that we had. So okay. he was given that task and accepted it graciously to get involved on that particular issue with the commercial fishing. Up there. Yes. So he did a great job with it. Yes, yeah. As I say, that, that, that's what I kind of did because I, I, I did not want to have a full subcommittee of the board, requires quorum postings. I just wanted to have somebody that could put their feet in the ground and meet with the fisheries. And, and then we kind of talked which topics we wanted to have that optics on it. Um, and that's kind of, I think it worked really well, Bill. I think you came back to the board and you kind of said, you know, as a board member, this is what I saw. And, and, and the many topics that gave me a chance to, to uh, you know, if I didn't have the time to really dig into the details, it gave me more than the three minutes that they're presented to us, you know, because you were in the, um, so I think that's a good idea, Kaz, what you're, what you're doing. I think it gives us, you know, it's the bill of water. You, you kind of decide, you guys kind of decide where you want to have Bill put his feet on. There's a lot of topics on water. I expect the administration to come back to the liaison or the chair and say, this is what's on the hot. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, well, like, what's on the hot seat? What's, what do we got going on the next 12 months? And then I'll report back to the chair and say, this is what's going on. Where do you really want to put the, the, the details on? So I think it works really well. If I could, if I could finish my... The, so now the, the, it's the combination of fish and wildlife is with Dr. Preen, with him having the authority to separate out. Can I make the offer to Bill Bruins if there's something specific related to water, it is of interest to me and I would be happy to help if uh, it doesn't fit your schedule, Bill B. Sure. What we're doing is trying to minimize a contact person for department staff. We need to get information from department staff um, without formally noticing the whole board. So in the instance with um, Bill Smith, when he did that fishing thing, they were communicating with him, how it was progressing, how things were moving. And, and, and the chair. And the chair. They did call me. So, and that way we're abreast of things. Now, if 
if Bill sees something that, hey, I think the whole board should hear about this, then he requests that from the chair. Um, some committees we did in my tenure on here, only one subcommittee and that was on CWD. Um, and uh, that required noticing meetings. Um, we went to several public meetings on it. We had to notice all those. Um, and that makes the whole process much more cumbersome than just getting the information directly. Um, so that's why we're not gonna do subcommittees. We may do a subcommittee on some big issue coming down the road, but as of right now, I don't see anything that requires a subcommittee. Okay, my, I, my point of clarity was if it works with fish and wildlife, I'm just offering to Bill Bruins because I was not asked to, to have a formal assignment, but that's an item of interest to me. So that was just an offer of help. Okay, uh, that, that would be fine. I'm uh, sure Mar Bill Marcy, uh, you, you can contact me anytime on any anything related to water that, that's of interest to you. Thank you. I might add, Mr. Chair, that uh, the, the liaison Positions have been here as long as I've been here. Yep. I mean, that, that's, a, that's been an ongoing structure of the board. And uh, I think it's worked pretty effectively. But also, uh, board members, you're responsible. Yep. Pay attention. But it's hard to be paying attention to every issue we deal with. So oh, yeah. that's why we count on our liaison Absolutely. to get into the weeds. Not so, a full-time job. Right. <laughs> Just so, a comment on the success of our experiment with the focus on fishing. A lot of that credit, the majority of that credit goes to staff. They've been very great to work with. Leadership has given, has given me access to staff and staff to me directly, and it allowed for a very good working relationship and a good efficiency. And I want to recognize that uh, on the record of the work of staff on those issues. I also would like to ask uh, for clarity, uh, respect that Doc has taken over as liaison for fisheries as part of the fish and wildlife assignment. Where does that leave me and my role with the commercial fishing issue that I am dealing with? <laughs> Just for the clarity for staff and I am the fisher, but it would go after me. That's why I asked clarifications. Am I able to communicate okay. with them? So we will discuss it after me. Yeah. I think you can close. Thank you. Okay. And I appreciate your comments there, Bill, and the cooperation of staff. And I hope that the department more than takes it under advisement because that we need that clarification from staff um, and that communication with staff. And I don't believe it's been happening all the way around for the last couple of years. So, um, and that's important for this board to function. So that takes care of board members matters. We'll be adjourned. Um, Entertain a motion to adjourn. Support. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right. Dave Harry.